what can you tell us about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier? Um, I can I can confirm that I'm I have a role in it. <laughs> right, and you're one of those notoriously tight Disney contracts. Are we? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, well said. I can confirm, and I can also confirm that it. Um, I believe, as so many things are right now, uh, is unbelievably timely, um, almost to a degree of prescience. Oh, that's great. Well, let's speak about the evolution of that genre, because now you're a part of, I think it was a $150 million production for a television show. And how have you seen this subgenre evolve in your involvement in it uh, over the last 20 years? It's interesting for me because I never read comics. As a child, I was not allowed to. My father and mother were very strict about um, what was literature, what was um, worthwhile in terms of the development of your mind, and uh, comic books never fell into that. So I never, I didn't know much about any of it. Um, yet when I first stumbled upon it, I was intrigued and I felt it was as viable as some of the best literature I had ever encountered. Especially, especially certain comics took a look um, at the darker, uh, lesser angels of humankind and the way those forces play out. Sometimes for the good, but how they're generally based in some form of hurt or some aspect of denial with which a character has to cope or develops in reaction to that thing that they, they feel um, was so wrong, so unfair, and you know, from Batman to um, no, Superman, all of, the, all of the, the heroes seem to have some moment of um, massive discomfort that their, psych their psychology has not yet <laughs> come to grips with. The reason that I know your work in the first place was a little made-for-TV film uh, co-written by some guy named Sam Raimi, who at the time had... Really <laughs> had um, Sam Allen's Sam Raimi, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. And so Mantis, which, you know, by today's standards, I, I still, I think it holds up. Um, yeah. I recorded this and wore the tape out because I well, love so much. I can't tell you how gratifying that is for me because that that initial pilot was that was the document. What took place subsequently was a pale imitation. Looking at that work, it was trendsetting. It was, you know, the first black superhero on network television. Mm -hmm. The influences of you know African American culture, uh, the cast itself because it starred a young Gina Torres, and you know it was just it was amazing. And I mean, even at the time, I didn't think about that at 14 years old. I just saw an amazing superhero property. And also, what I loved about that character is not only is he a black superhero, but he's uh, had a physical disability as well. Yeah. And it's just even as a kid, you go, "This is amazing. This is something I haven't seen before." Um, yeah. Did you think about that at the time? Because it was kind of your first foray into superhero. Was it yeah, it, it, it definitely was my first foray, and I wanted to do it very badly. For less for the superhero reasons, or at least in the, um, in the initial statement of the, in that, that made for TV movie, he had been taken out by violence. And his reaction was to create systems that would prevent death. What Sam and Sam came up with was this idea of old knowledge um, and knowledge that connected the character with the motherland, that connected the character with deep traditions, traditions that had been cut off during the diaspora, that he was seeking to pull back into his own life as a way of infusing that into the lives of as many people as he could. That was amazing. And may I say, at any age, Gina Torres is just 
uh, one of the finest actresses and just uh, one of the most beautiful people um, in one of the most beautiful packages a person could want to move around. In. Let me just say on record, record, I think Andrea Romano has arguably done some of the greatest work, assembly work, in terms of putting these teams together because Warner Brothers animation is, again, to use that word, perennial. So mm -hmm. how, did, how did you become part of this kind of real-life superhero team? Andrea Romano. Andrea Romano, and then Bruce Tim, but Andrea Romano. She um, brought me in on a couple of other projects, I think prior to Justice League, mm -hmm. and she, was, she encouraged me to do um, voice work. She was unbelievably supportive, and I remember going in for the audition and having this idea that the, the, what centered me in Martian Manhunter John Jones was that this was an individual who, yes, was an immigrant, but had no way to stay in touch with his homeland, that he had, his society had been destroyed, and he was the lone survivor. Mm -hmm. He was the repository for all of the wisdom and all of the pain and all of the loneliness, the deep loneliness, and seeking to be a part of something else. Uh, and again, a theater experience on a microphone, even including the fact that very often we were assembled together. Right. And you know, these amazing artists, I mean, I, I still feel um, of all the things that I have gotten a chance to be a part of, uh, voiceover is the area that I um, have done the least and sort of, um, love the most. You don't have to shave, no makeup. Um, <laughs> you, um, and what you bring has to be realized not only in the moment, but realized in through your voice. So I, my, I have nothing but reverence, total reverence for the people who do it regularly. Um, and all of them were stars um, to sit in a studio and listen to them operate. I used to just I used to just thrill to that and, and learn, as you always do. It had to have been a personal catharsis for you as well, especially, you know, considering the things we've already spoken of. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the things being that I did not have to sound or to do some sort of placement or dialect that made me sound more American. He was not an American character. Right. He wasn't an earthly character. So I could just bring me and my, my voice to, to John. Then imagining what happened when I got cast to play John's father on Supergirl, mm -hmm. and I encountered David Harewood. Whatever pri proprietary sense I had about that character, I had to give over <laughs> because what he does is, it's, that's it. I think what makes this so proprietary, it, you know, not necessarily to you personally, but to the fans, um, I've had the privilege of speaking with Kevin Conroy as well. Uh, yeah. Saying the same thing 25 years later, he's still voicing that character uh, right. You've both done it for two decades plus, you know, in video games and other iterations. I think it's your humility that, quite frankly, speaks to the fans more than anything. You never once said, this is my character. Um, and I think, ironically, you know, because of that, uh, you as performers um, have always just been inherent, intrinsically linked to those characters. I think a lot of people still consider you know, him, the Batman, and you, the Martian Man, even though we've had all these fantastic iterations. So, um, yeah. well, thank you for your work with Thank that. you. Thank you. Hey, Real Students, thanks for watching. If you want to subscribe to Real School, click that round Real School logo right beside me. Also, click that damn notification bell so you're aware of all of Real School's new content. You can follow me on Twitter, and of course, if you get anything out of Real School, you can always give a little back. Just click the link in the description below or the button down there, and you can become part of my Patreon team.